Can you ask Nate if he can hear us now? <laughs> hey, Nate. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Write him a chat message. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna start. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, you can hear. <laughs> okay, so let me let me introduce. Uh, I can just just a second. Uh, so I'm, I I mean like welcome everybody. Thank you for coming and thanks especially to Iker for for accepting giving the uh, this talk. Uh, so Iker is originally from here from from Donosti. He was, he's actually from the same neighborhood in which we are right now. Um, and uh, well, he did his undergrad in Bilbao. Uh, and then... Eight minutes is perfect. It was an eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Marcos, you're super beautiful. <laughs> Not this one, right? <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, so he did his master's uh, in University Autonoma in theoretical physics, but I guess you decided to come down from the realm of ideas to you know like to to do some some astrophysics and it was, an astro it was a, there's no astrophysics part yeah but it's theoretical physics nonetheless <laughs> anyways and now I mean, he's currently finishing his phd in like in few months uh he will be over it will be over uh and under supervision of uh mercedes moya and yago Escasibar. um yeah and basically he is an expert now in chemical evolution of galaxies and synth synthesis of stellar population so Iker, whenever you want Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you, thank you, Marcos. I want to thank, uh, thank also uh, the IPC for, for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. So I'm going, I'm here to present uh, the, um, I, well, I presented me with uh, Iker, and I'm going to present um, HRP Boxstar, a new tool to create single star populations and uh, how to use them to analyze spectra. So, okay. Is it disconnected or? Yeah, okay, now. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, make a little introduction. I want to speak about how to do single star populations, then how to compose them, uh, and then I'm going to present uh, uh, an actual uh, science case uh, for the analysis of star populations in damp one a supernova host galaxies, and some little conclusions. So. Um, the state-of-the-art instruments such as MUSE, Megara, Desi, or nearby instruments such as uh, BLT Moons or WIF that are going to come in the next few months or years uh, have very high resolution and uh, ha and have very good spatial and uh, spectral resolution, and they create a huge amount of data that are needed to analyze. So it's necessary to have a fast and accurate way to extract all the possible information that is contained in that spectra. Uh, such as, for example, the mean age, mean metallicity, the game mean energy history, star formation history, etc. But the best uh, way, the best tool to do this is to use a synthetic spectra of SSPs that can be very fastly done and uh, with a huge, uh, in, a, in a good uh, coverage. And they can be used uh, to use to compare directly to the templates of the, of the data that you have. If you think that there's a one population on the one population it's dominated, or you can uh, plug them into a, a spectral analysis code, such as uh, Starlight, Fado, um, uh, Seagal, uh, whatever you want, to, to be able to uh, analyze the spectra of the galaxy. And it also, you can uh, make a composition uh, to create a more complex star population, like a combination of an old on a, on a junk one, or, may, or more tricky if you have, um, 
you have a, a model that can give you the star formation history and the chemical enrichment history of the whole galaxy to create a more accurate spectra based on, on simulations um, that can you can compare with the, uh, the galaxies that you have unresolved. So first, uh, what's the, a single star population? Uh, how will you compute them? Uh, the thing is that stars are not formed in um, just individually in a vacuum. So they, they are formed in groups in a star formation episode. So a uh, single star population, it's what we call that it's a group of stars that it's uh, born at the same time. So they have all, all the stars of the of that population have the same metallicity and because they are from the same cloud and they have the same age because they are born at the same time. So uh, the thing is that instead of having like a millions or billions to stars to account for, we just uh, can characterize that population with one age and one metallicity having the uncertainties of the initial mass function that we are going to speak about a little bit later. So, yeah, and we also can uh, combine them uh, to have, uh, if you have, uh, if, the, if the galaxy or the galactic region, it's a combination of multiple SSPs that can be think as a building blocks for a star pop, a, a subjacent stellar uh, population that is in the galaxy. So, sorry, do, do you want me to? to yes, build, uh, please. Uh, how do you? I think it's in mass. Uh, it is uh, I don't know what which one of those three is. Okay, thank you. So, uh, yeah, the thing is that uh, each SSP has, uh, especially the higher resolution one have like very specific features that can be used to determine exactly the age and the metallicity of the population. So they can be think as the fingerprints of, of a population. So for that, uh, we have created HR Peepop Star that uh, it's a new, uh, it's a code, a new code uh, in writing Python that it's uh, based on Popstar from Oyato 2009 that computes a higher solution spectra of SSPs. Our, our main objective was to have the, the best coverage in age and metallicity with a good wavelength covering range. So we have from 91 Armstrong that it's a very uh, far ultraviolet or, or high uh, X-rays to 24,000 uh, Armstrong, it's 2.4 microns that it's uh, the near infrared with a good, uh, um, a spectral resolution of uh, point, point 0.1 angstroms per, per pixel. So uh, how have we done that? Uh, what uh, we need some ingredients. Um, any any model needs these ingredients. Uh, we need to trace the, so we, we know that they are born at the same time. So uh, we want to know at uh, like, um, like a, a, a screenshot, like a, at which at which age for a given metallicity, uh, what uh, for example at hundred mega years, how will be how will those stars be? So for that uh, we need the stellar tracks and an initial mass function that it's the distribution of of stars by mass when they are born, and with that uh, with that and an isochron that traces the the star evolution. We then need the spectra for having the actual spectra of the stellar atmospheres to know what uh, do, do they emit. And an, an atlas that uh, just contains all the information that we need about the stellar atmospheres, such as the effective temperature, the surface gravity, the metallicity, the mass rate, and the surface um, surface abundance of hydrogen, for example, for a wolf ray star. So, uh, so, First ingredient, it's the, the isochrons. So it's it's important to know uh, in which evolutionary step is each star. So um, uh, <clears throat> you can see here, it's uh, the Hertzsprung-Russell Hertzsprung diagram, uh, where you can see here the main sequence. And uh, depending of the, of the mass, they will uh, end as supergiants, and or they if they have lower mass, they will be giants. And they, yes, will have a uh, post AUV Planetary nebula phase until they end up like a white dwarf, a white dwarf. 
So uh, the thing is that the isochron uh, just traces all the stellar tracks that each individual star of the of the stellar population has, and we just um, we just follow them. So uh, the thing is that how they are distributed. So how how much stars are? So when you get your isochrons, which isochrons do you use? I, I'm going to speak it uh, okay. later. Yeah, in a moment. Yeah, but uh, first uh, the initial mass function. Uh, we have to know. Uh, how they are distributed uh, by mass when they are born. So there are different parameterizations uh, of uh, Salpeter, Scalo, Kropa, Chabriel, and they are, uh, these are like um, the distribution that uh, they usually change a lot in the in the low mass part. So this is here is the mass and here's the, the IMF and the amount of stars. So uh, they are very, they are a lot of, low mass stars and very low uh, high mass stars. But uh, the, the, the slope changes and uh, there, there is not clear if, there, if this uh, shape is universal of it changes from the environment or some or maybe on the, um, on the, uh, on the first stages, they could be different. Uh, so, but uh, we are going to use like a, the, like a can canonical or so. so. We are going to use the IMFs of Kropa, like Salpeter, uh, Ferrini, and Chabrier, and the isochrons of the Padova group of Randenendis from Bresan, Fagotto, and Girardi. So this is the coverage in, in log of ages and metallicities of the isochrons that we are going to use. So the other one, uh, once we know how they have evolved, we have to know how much, uh, how much, uh, what's the spectra, what's, uh, what's the light that they have emitted, so uh, this uh, this is uh, for what does those we need the spectra of the star atmospheres, and they they heavily depend on the type of star it is, the um, the, um, uh, the chemical composition, the metallicity, the effective temperature, and the surface gravity. So uh, in our code, we divide it in like in four groups. Like so, we have called like cold stars from the mean sequence star of spectral type A to M. Then the hot stars that are O and B stars, like very, very big, very hot. Then the wolf rayet stars, and that are, um, are stars that have like a very, have a very mass, uh, loss ray, high mass loss rate. They have like a very strong wings and have like a very big structure. We are going, there's a picture later. And the post AGB and planetary nebulae. So uh, the main sequence stars are the major part of the existing stars. And they dominate the optical range. We have in the A to A to or from A to M. So uh, we have this is an example of a of a 15, 15 Kelvin and a gra surface gravity of four uh, star that of solar metallicity are all the examples. And, uh, and we have used the Coelho Coelho two thousand fourteen. And we have them in a in a same all have the same uh, with the same metallicity coverage. So then the O and B type stars are the heaviest and the hottest. Uh, they have very strong uh, ionization spectrum that can uh, make them uh, um, um, they um, heat the for example nebula. It's a trivial nebula that it's uh, that it's heated by a O type star. And if their spectrum is much more, it's just a steeper and has a very hot, uh, there's no here, but they have very, very strong uh, ionizing profile. So we are using uh, in uh, effective temperature range of 24,000 to 55,000 of a more limited uh, surface gravity and then the same ones from Sander and uh, et al. 2015 and et al. 2019. So uh, stars with masses uh, 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 of, mm. that have smaller mass, the uh, A-star masses, uh, end up their lives as white doors. And uh, the latest, late stage of these uh, low and intermediate mass stars, it's uh, usually the post agb and planetary nebulae, this uh, nebulae. Um, these stars are very hot, and uh, the stars are very hot and very dense, because it's uh, just uh, it's amazing when stars that begins to lose its uh, it's all its shells, and it ends up just being the, the core of the star and illuminates, uh, has a very strong uh, ionizing profile because they have like uh, temperatures between 5,000 and 190,000 Kelvin, and they they could have up to 
up to 300,000 Kelvin or 400,000 Kelvin depends on the metallicity. And they have a very strong surface gravity and we have taken the ones from RAW uh, 2003. And the last ones uh, are the Wolfram Jet stars that are very, very high mass stars that have very strong wings and a high mass loss rate. They, they, these wings like expels very heavily the mass. They have an extreme mass loss rate and uh, the the star illuminate all you have here where we read 124 you can see here is the star and the structure that it creates uh here you see and uh, you can see it's not clear but here you see the whole spectrum but it has a very uh, a lot of emission um features it have pesigny profiles because of the because of the expulsion of uh, the gas with a heavy the high speed and we are using uh, the ones from the Potsdam group from Sander et al. 2012, Todd et al. 2015, and Sander et al. 2015 uh, for different kinds of, they, they are classified by the chemical, they are like two, like carbon and nitrogen, that depends on the, um, sur uh, it has more stuff, but it depends on the surface gravity of hydrogen, uh, the, the abundance of hydrogen in the, in the last, uh, in the shells. In the in the atmosphere, uh, they have the very size, uh, the mass loss rate that could have uh, from solar masses per year, and uh, they they have uh, metallicities from uh, minus one solar to in log to solar. So once we have all the ingredients, how we just uh, mix the stuff to have uh, everything together. So uh, the code just uh, asks for uh, for H from uh, metallicity and the uh, IMF that you want to use. So you can try different ones and uh, it, uh, it it gives you, it changes the, it changes the final result. So once you have, you just read the Atlas, the isochron and the library, and uh, each, um, it read out the isochron and assigns for each, uh, for each uh, star in the, for each uh, mass step in the isochron, it just checks if it's, uh, a normal regular star, uh, star that does, doesn't have much uh, mass loss rate, or it has a very strong mass loss rate. So uh, it just have a special assignation of the world red stars, or if not, it just assign them by uh, effective temperature as surface gravity. And it, it iterates um, until everything, every, all the isochron is done. And then just in the end, uh, just add up all the spectra to have the, the stellar spectra of the SP. <laughs> But uh, yes, yeah, so you can see here, you have the spectra and uh, you can use if they have strong or strong wings. So uh, here, if they have like soft wings, they're like gonna start here, you in red, you see the isochron of a, seven, uh, of a 30, 30 mega year uh, population. And uh, in, in blue dots, you see the, uh, where the stellar, what the stellar atmospheres that uh, we have. So for each uh, point in the isochron, it finds the nearest neighbor in the face of temperature and surface gravity and just assign it. Uh, checks the, the error and renormalize it. And then uh, considers the, um, the amount of stars that there is uh, that uh, depends on the, um, on the isochron, the, on the IMF that we have, and then just uh, compute the, the spectra. The thing with the yet is that it's not easy because the, the, the temperature of the atmosphere of the water yet it's not the same one as the as the effective tem as the temperature that are usually in the isochrons so they are assigned by the by the radius of a given um, optical depth the composition of the atmosphere to check which kind of water yet is is and uh, the mass loss rate so uh, once we have the stellar the stellar contribution uh, computed, we compute the nebular continuum emission uh, because uh, when in the star formation process, not all the not all the gas that uh, that begins the star formation process ends up as stars. In the majority, it's expelled, and that this um, this gas can be heated by uh, ionizing. If there is an a powerful ionizing source. It will heat up and it will emit uh, lines, of course, as this, but it will uh, emit a uh, continuum emission. That uh, this continuum emission depends on the ionizing flux of the stars, the, the, the amount of ionizing photons that emits uh, that, this, that population, and the properties of the surrounding gas, the, effect, the, the electron temperature and the mm, electron density. So um, that depends on the, 
<coughs> that sorry that depends on the um, on the gas so <coughs> we compute the, um, the luminosity of the nebular continuum by just a uh, emission coefficient uh, the amount of ionizing photons and then um, and alpha b is the the recombination coefficient for the for the hydrogen so the emission coefficient it's divided between the hydrogen the helium and a two and a two photon continuum emission uh here you can see the nebular emission of uh 20 uh, 15 uh, mega year of solar metallicity source so you can see here and uh so what are results? what are the final products of pop star so you have you have line emission as well as continuum emission? No, not yet. It's a future work. I was going to say uh, our plan. Yeah, it's uh, this is just a continuum emission. So to the properly, we should uh, plug the results. For example, uh, the um, for example these uh, results inside a cloudy or moccasin or something like that, and uh, just to have the proper emission. But uh, in the first step, uh, we just added the continuum emission, not the not the not the lines yet. So uh, here I show some example of this piece, uh, and to compare, uh, I put the pop star ones to see the the difference in the in the resolution. So pop star has uh, a resolution of uh, one thousand of an R of one thousand, and P pop star has an R of five fifty thousand in um, in in uh, five thousand in five thousand angstroms. So uh, here you can see that the the CD is pretty similar, but the, there's a lot of features and different uh, a lot of information that can be obtained that uh, wasn't previously seen in uh, lower resolution <laughs> models. Here it's a seven mega year that has um, that has our uh, like the last ones that have uh, the last stages that have, could have already uh, that have the mission, and you see that there's a lot of difference in the INAC profile because of the of the new atmospheres that were used. And here are 13 here, very old, very, very old population that it's kind of similar, but um, there's a lot much, much more information in the of on of all the absorption lines of uh, of main sequence, especially M and the planetary nebula, M type stars. And then we have also computed the um, all the magnitudes from uh, uh, from SLOA from SDSS and uh, so, so, uh, the uh, Sloan filters and the Johnson filters, uh, UB, uh, UBV, uh, RHGH, and uh, here are the results, for example, of B. And uh, all, all, we have also have the colors, computed for the colors uh, of from different metallicities, and it's a byproduct that can be used, in, uh, that are, it's not necessary to download and compute the, um, Computed by yourself, it can be done using the mouse. But we have also computed the amount of ionizing photons for a uh, hydrogen, for helium, for helium two, uh, and from oxygen two. And uh, here, for example, of the amount of for the hydrogen that it's uh, for to have that we have used for the um, nebular continuum emission. That uh, you see here, there's uh, there's like a lot of um, this in 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 logarithmic scale. So we have a lot of uh, ionizing photons that when the stars uh, and then O and B, the buffer yet begin to die, they just, uh, there's a big drop off, like uh, six orders of magnitude. And then we have a small um, increase by the, by the planetary nebulae and the, um, the post AGB and planetary nebulae that contribute a little bit uh, just to, to increase the, the amount of ionizing photons. Yeah. Uh do you have a way of kind of validating all your modeling? Because I guess you are doing like several like No, we, yeah, we have checked uh, in for Megara, and then I'm going to show uh, we have done use these models for analysis. We have checked all the colors, the magnitudes, the colors, and the amount of ionizing photons for with different authors of the literature. And uh, with observations, we have uh, uh, do a, um, a check for the uh, for colors uh, for magnitudes. And then uh, we have uh, compared with uh, data of Megara that has uh, like it's all that the same resolution, uh, this resolution uh, to check the the models are validated. I don't have the pictures, but they are in paper. I can show you later. But uh, especially for the um, 
for the young population to see like you are able to see the special features like the wolf rayet features and the uh, and the pet signal profiles of some uh, so uh, it uh, it has been validated with the data. So the, the, the spectra are all theoretical spectrum. Yes, they are, I'm using uh, theoretical libraries. Uh, so theoretical libraries don't always fit observe stars very well. Uh, yeah, I would get yeah, these ones uh, usually. Uh, uh, yeah, they are, they are. They have we have checked and they and they are validated for the data. Um, the the compo the composition. Not I don't know the theoretical the, um, the individual stars, but uh, the colors are and the magnitudes are usually. Yeah, colors and magnitudes are easier. Yes. So if you look, you looked at star clusters. People often yes. validate on on uh, on, on. Yeah, we have checked. Uh, we have checked from the of Megara of uh, of a globular cluster. And they, it, it matched much uh, very well with the the results of the literature. So, um, uh, so I guess it might be other processes that are not included here. I don't know. I guess do you think binary stars and whether that? No, we haven't uh, we haven't included binary stars or rotation. In the, it's in the future world. It's in the future plans. So the fact that it has been validated means that those processes are not important for whatever target accuracy you you put after. Uh, we haven't. We, we should make like um, do it with binaries and make a, a proper comparison because maybe the ages are not. Uh, so when you mean validating, you're validating against uh, like, theoretical like, models or against observation? No, uh, the same observation doing uh, with with binaries and without binaries and see the results, the change of the results, or with rotation. So yes, check the same um, or with mock uh, with mock observations. It's better. Well, mock observations is just using the same models. Or using, different, or, or using different models, for example. So use one model from other authors, and you just try to fit it with, uh, with binaries and without binaries, for example. But no, but when you say your models are validated, I, I haven't understood whether you mean that they fit observed they, data. Yes, we have checked with observed data. At, at this resolution? At this resolution, yes. That of Megara. Okay. Uh, yes. So. Uh, yes. So. Um, yeah. So then uh, we can do a composition of the SSPs to make, for example, like a mock catalog or like a two comp composition of uh, of two SSPs to make a, co a complex uh, stellar population. That uh, we have to decompose with star formation history and a chemical enrichment history to obtain the, the actual spectra. So that we need a base of SSPs that are normalized to one storm mass, uh, a star formation history, and a metallicity enrichment history. So, uh, and also if we have to want to simulate the, the observation, uh, we have to simulate uh, the, the effects of some effects that happen to the, to the, um, the spectra when it surpasses the intergalactic medium or extinction of the Milky Way. So we have uh, used for the for the absorption of the intergalactic medium, we have used uh, Inoue till 2014. And, uh, and the extinction we have used uh, uh, Fitzpatrick with a station map of Shalafli and Flintbear. And uh, we, this is an example, it's not, um, it's uh, not been, uh, it's not called, it's like in a prototype yet, but uh, it's an example of a galaxy of uh, one at the tube one with a constant star formation and a constant metallicity as uh, to be in a check of, of the effects and the, and the effects were correct, but it's not uh, yet um, validated nor checked, it's just a uh, prototype. And then uh, the other part is um, what we have done, uh, that I have done, it's the analysis of uh, star population using my uh, the basis of Popstar to to analyze Type One A supernova host galaxies. So uh, yeah, for so uh, the, the plan, the thing is that uh, Type One A supernova are very important to the, for example, uh, supernova cosmology because they are standardizable candles. And uh, using the peak brightness, the width of the light core, and their color. But uh, the thing is that uh, the, these uh, standardization techniques are usually being done in very local environment with a very uh, with a more limited um, metallicities and ages. So uh, we wanted to study the effect of the metallicity 
of the galaxies uh, of the stellar population of the galaxies that host type one a supernovae in the distance modulus of the supernova. I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, the supernova distances are based on the spectra of the supernova, not not of the host galaxy. No, the distance modulus of the of the life curve. So if, if the metallicity affect the the life curve of the supernova. Exactly. So you have to calculate the light curve of the single supernova mm -hmm. that doesn't involve making population synthesis of the host galaxy. Uh, yeah, you wanted. Uh, there have been previous works of uh, people that uh, studied the the abundance of the gas to see if it affects. Because uh, there are works, theoretical works, that say that the metallicity of the host the star of the that were explored as a type one supernova um, depends on the amount of uh, nickel fifty six and would affect the. So yeah, it's uh, it's to see the effect of the star population. Uh, in the mean, the all of the whole star population, because uh, we plan, we plan to, we the plan was to make a like a, a big redshift from redshift one to zero to one. So uh, we just uh, yeah, there was no way to analyze the all the there weren't lines for um, the, <coughs> there weren't spectral lines uh, of gas. So we as we didn't have the gas to compute the abundance for all. We wanted to study the star population. It's not um, we have like the mean. Uh, it's the mean results of the star population. So it's not like directly correlated, but it's it, there. We see that there is a correlation between the mean stellar metallicity and the and the and the <clears throat> and the Hubble residual for the distance models. Okay. I mean, you have some IFU data, so you could actually um, get uh, a metallicity yes. measurement very close to the supernova. Yeah. Yes, 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 uh, yes. Uh, the thing is that uh, the, those were very, like if IFU were very local, we wanted to see the if there was an effect or if uh, the result changed with metal if it's a high redshift range. I don't know if I okay. Yeah, I have maybe a more basic question, but like I don't understand how you implement the supernova in the code because I understand that you can produce spectra for for stellar populations, but how do you determine when a supernova goes in? You know, like it's based on the statistical population of that galaxy, or uh, okay, um, <laughs> okay, yeah, no, the thing is that we analyze the spectra of the galaxy, and then apart the in the we in in a, like it's like it's like a two two part analysis. One of the uh, galaxy of the its star population, and then the analysis of the light curve of the supernova, and then we try to correlate them. So it's not it's like a choose a separate analysis. I guess, I guess essentially you just want to see whether the properties of the supernovae correlates with the properties, with the properties of, the of the galaxy. Yes, of the star population, star population of the mean galaxy. Yeah. So it's actually with the observational data, so that you are modeling this in the like the supernova, mod, supernova not model within the star population. No, 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 no. Yes, yes. Sorry, this this was a, an okay, application like of the of of this uh, star of yes. this. Yes, maybe I was too too. I was speaking too quickly. So yeah, this is an application in in to use the to use the SSPs to anal to analyze the the star populations in the host galaxies and. Then apart, we analyze the host uh, supernova and see if there was any correlation between the data of the supernova and the data of the okay, okay. of the host galaxies. And particularly, you want to see if there's a residual. Yes. Yes. The, the Hubble diagram. Yes. Exa so, exactly. So Metal rich galaxies have brighter supernovae than metal yeah. poor galaxies, for example. Yes. Uh, yes. I was going to show. Okay. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is a, a part of a project uh, that has been developing that they, they it's when mainly done for uh to study the gas abund the abundance of gas of uh, the more nearby environment that they were like very very local and uh, we wanted to see uh, if not if not, with not the same so uh, this was the metallicity the abundance in the gas and we want the mean metallicity of the stellar population but to see if there is any change. If there is any, if if the if the studies that have been done at lo more local redshift uh, are are sustained at uh, with a higher redshift. Uh, so type one a supernova is a thermal explosion that happens uh, when a white dwarf surpasses the Chandrasekhar limit. It can be two two types, uh, two uh, 
If it's a single degenerate, it's just a white dwarf that begins to accrete until it uh, reaches the Chandrasekhar uh, Chandrasekhar mass and explodes. And if it's double generates, it's two white dwarfs that uh, begin to attract each other until they um, and then they uh, they collide. And then if it's uh, more more than Chandrasekhar mass, it explodes. Uh, and there the are several applications that the amount of nickel fifty six that it's the 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 element the radioactive element that um, just drives the the life course of the supernova that it could vary with between a twenty five percent between one third solar and three times solar. So there are like theoretical suggestions that uh, there could be a metallicity dependence. So uh, we have uh, six galaxies with a series in the range of 0 0.5 or 0 0.4 0 and 0 0.5, 644 galaxies of SDSS, and 19 galaxies from the Cosmos Survey uh, for 0 0.5 to 1. And the data from the T1 supernovae are obtained by in for each one for SACO 2013, Suzuki and 2012, and Guy uh, 2007. The, all the stretch, the color, and the magnitude. And we have used the parametrization of SACO, of characterization of uh, SACO et al. 2014 to obtain the distance modulus of the supernova. So uh, for, for the analysis we have uh, of the stellar population, we have used uh, FADO, it's fitting analysis using differential evolution and optimization. Uh, that it's a uh, Gomez and Papel 2017, that it's a uh, spectral population synthesis that. Um, that it uh, it extracts the transformation history, the mean age, the chemical enrichment, and the difference between these codes and other codes is that uh, it um, matches the the evolution of the nebular emission to the to the to the, um, to the analysis of the <clears throat> of the of the stellar population. So it kinds of like it's more robust in principle. So you mean line emission? Or yeah, the line emission of uh, H alpha, H beta, and oxygen, some of oxygen depends on the range that you have. So, uh, yeah, we have used the pop star ones, but uh, we have uh, used in other, um, we have made a special set uh, because uh, we wanted a little bit of, of less, uh, have lower metallicity spectra. Uh, so we have used uh, both uh, the standard ones and the and the another ones that use the stellar library of Munari to to lower the um, to lower the the metallicity from minus uh, to to uh, ten percent solar to one percent solar, let's say. And uh, with that, using uh, Fado with a uh, pop star, we have analyzed the um, these are the first the uh, galaxy parameters. So here it's the mean age by uh, um, weighted by mass and the ma total mass form. And uh, here you see this and the color code, it's the metallicities. So uh, we have have mm, we have this is from Galaxy at all 2005. And we have like a younger population that we think that it's uh, maybe because of the different SSPs use uh, that change, um, that change, especially in, uh, in the young part, the SSPs are very dif uh, different in the young part. So uh, maybe it's the effect of having a younger population. And we have the mass metallicity relation that it uh, we have compared also with Galassi and uh, Gonzalez Delgado 2014. And it's uh, more similar. It's a little uh, a higher metallicity part, but it's not, not as significant as the young part. So it's, it's more or less um, similar with the previous results. Uh, so for that, uh, once we have analyzed and checked the, the correlations, uh, the, the correlation between the galaxy parameters, we wanted to see the, the, the effects of the, on the supernova. So we computed the Hubble diagram, each, each dot, it's uh, one supernova with the error bar in blue. And in red, uh, we have used the cosmology of uh, a flat lambda CDM with a mega matter of 0 0.415. And an H0 of 70, uh, as according to SACO 2000, 2014, that, that's uh, what we have used as a parametrization. So then we just, um, for each dot, uh, blue dot, we have, uh, uh, we just uh, do the residual for the cosmology that we have used to obtain what's called the Hubble residual and to see if there's uh, any correlation. 
So first we check with the mass that it's, uh, um, there's a lot of work in the literature uh, that uh, has to check uh, to the in clear, and then we see a clear correlation between the hollow residual and the, and the current mass that it's observed. What's the error bar? <laughs> no, oh, it's, it, it's, it's a, there's a mean error bar that's not. Um, so the error bar on the correlation. Of the correlation, it's a uh, degree. It looks like it would be consistent with no correlation as well. Uh, no, we have checked, and it's uh, it's not. It's uh, uh, yeah, we have checked. Even there's, it has a significance of. Uh, yeah, you should put an error bar on the coefficient so we can see that. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, we have checked, and there there is a correlation. So uh, between the high residual and the current mass. And then we have checked for the metallicity, the mean stellar metallicity, the mean, uh, stellar metallicity and the hull residual. And we have uh, also tried to divide to see if there's like two population, like in blue, the low mass, in red, the, the high mass. Uh, and we have found uh, with, um, with a coefficient of a slope of minus 0 0.063. It's not a very big uh, effect, but it's an effect to take into account. And we have checked with the literature in left, uh, it's with all the words that I have used uh, the gas abundance. So it's not, it's similar, but it's not kind of the same of, uh, of work because in if you me measure the gas abundance, it's you measure the abundance of the last uh, metallicity or the metallicity of the last uh, star formation part. And in the, you and we measure the mean stellar metallicity. Uh, so in here in, in the red, in the right part, you see the, 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 the one for the papers that have also computed uh, the, the mean stellar metallicity. But uh, so uh, we find um, that have similar values to PAN 2014, but with a slower, uh, smaller error bars because of the, the statistics, the bigger statistics that we have. And uh, the, and the, um, <clears throat> So we see similar, uh, but in a high, higher, very much higher uh, redshift, redshift range because the uh, pan has like a very like quite kind of local 0 0.09 up to 0 0.09 of redshift. So uh, higher resolution spectra of uh, of SSPs are, are needed to extract the correct information of state of the data. Uh, for that, we have created the higher resolution spectra of SSPs. And complex star population, uh, we are, have plans to include uh, new isochrons in the in the synthesis to check uh, uh, like variations in the synthesis. For example, for with rotation, but uh, future work it would be also to include binaries, for example, uh, and and if uh, we link with a with a chemical evolution model or a or a cosmology simulation that would give us the um, we could create like more catalogs of galaxies if we have like a star formation history and the metallicity enrichment history. Uh, we have analyzed also for uh, 679 galaxies that host type one supernovae. Uh, we have found that the, we have like younger populations than, the, than some in the literature, the galaxy 2005, that we think that can be attributed to the SSPs used as a template. And uh, we have found a correlation in mass and in metallicity that it's in accordance to their studies, uh, but has uh, like higher statistics, so the errors are are smaller. Thank you very much. Yep. Questions? Okay. So I was wondering um, if you looked separately at the gas phase metallicity and the stellar metallicity, and um, whether the correlations in the supernova were more correlated with gas phase or stellar. Oh. Yeah, yeah. The thing in these galaxies is that from from all these ones, uh, just a few a few have like very clear uh, emission lines to be able to to measure the oxygen abundance, for example. But uh, yeah, it could be done, for example, in, with IFU data that are like very near, and try to do that kind of work to see to see the differences. Uh, this work was more uh, planned to see the, the difference in the redshift that we find that there's no much differences in, if you increase the redshift, but we didn't uh, know if there was a 
redshift change. But yes, uh, the thing is that uh, we didn't have much mission line, so we couldn't do the the match. But it it would be uh, great to do like yes for a selected population that could have like both and see the differences. This would be very good to to uh, increase uh, to a small uh, um, more the error of the of the analysis of the correlations. Yeah, about this last part as well. Um, just uh, so here you you search how the the residual of the apple diagram are connected to the properties of the host galaxies. Right? Yes. Could you do you have enough data on the? I mean, could you actually do it on the on the light curve itself of the supernova? Uh, we have the data that we have the magnitude, the color, and the stretch, and we just uh, used a parameterization to to analyze it. But we didn't have the light curves. Are there studies that actually look at directly at the light curves? How those depend on the properties of those? I don't know. I'm not sure, but the, may may could could be. Like. Uh... So about the last part as well. This uh, supernova sample uh, is it uh, one that has been used to measure age not? Uh, not this sample exactly. The part, the Sloan part, yes. A uh, uh, future work that was planned was to to calculate uh, to use age not with this. Try to uh, reduce the Hubble. Uh, use this. Um, like an extra parameter to to compute the distance modulus, and with that used to measure H naught, but it's not done yet. It's future work that we wanted to do. This was just more related to see uh, the possible correlations for within the host. Do, do you have any idea of uh, whether this correlation could move the value of H naught by by a little, by how much? No, by how much? No. No, we uh, needed to do it before I don't uh, have. Uh, it's it's um <clears throat> it's like a point uh, like a point uh, fifteen dex between the the lowest metal city and the highest metal city. So, but I don't know how much. It depends on the. You only get H naught because you have a calibration using other distance indicators for the nearest galaxies. The type 1A supernova. The supernova itself doesn't have an absolute distance. So you have to calibrate it using CEPIs or I these other measures. So it depends on the particular metallicities of the galaxies that have supernova in them. I don't know what the answer is. I think they're mostly relatively bright. So they're probably mostly close to solar. It's not so it, could be, it could be that the higher redshift ones are typically lower metallicity. And and so there, there is a spread my metallicity, but uh, the effect, the maximum effect, it's like point uh, fifteen dex. So the, well, they are, a lot. Yes, but it's like a very extremist, and there are not much uh, low metallicity. There, there are not much supernova in low metallicity. So yeah, it's more like close to solar on super solar and sub solar, but like half solar. So even so for the high not, redshift ones, that's true. What? Even for the high redshift ones. The higher achieve ones have uh because you'd need a you need a systematic as a function of redshift. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh they have no, they have lower metallicities, but uh there are not much galaxies oh. with with like like one percent or two percent solar metallicity. Oh, no, 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 but they have like a half solar, quarter solar metallicities. But one thing is whether it I mean, certainly could introduce a bias if you're professionally selecting certain type of galaxies with redshift and also it's different than the calibration, but also you can turn it around and use these to improve the measurement of, of uh, H0. Right? So you're saying part of the scatter in the relation uh, comes from in internal correlations. So it's okay, not due yeah. to, so your relation before, before would have like certain amount of scatter. Now, if you Probably account for this correlation, the scatter would be smaller. Yeah, but there's, there's still, a, I mean, the error bars here are meaningless, mm -hmm. right? There, there are lots of points which are 20 sigma away from correlation. So clearly the error bars aren't right. Exactly, right? But you still, have in your, your cosmology measurement depends on the scatter in the points, not only in the error bars, but individual points. So if you find oh, a, transform, a, a transformation of your space that reduces the scatter among points, you end up with a more accurate estimation. Uh, of I mean, I don't know. 
I, I, I guess they probably ignore these error bars when they actually fit here because you don't, I, you don't really understand what's mm -hmm. causing the scatter. So you just assume it's something and assume it's Gaussian. Yeah, right. But so you're saying, what I'm saying is that part of this scatter is due to the intrinsic correlations between galaxy properties and supernova. Yeah, so if you can account yes. for that, then the scatter should be some smaller in this higher dimensional space. The, the scatter. So then you, if you account for it, you should but get stronger constraints. You saw the plots you had, they were, they were slopes were really tiny, so there was a very small part yeah, of it. Yeah, maybe you don't gain much, but you should be able to gain some of this. Actually, I think that I remember some papers many years ago where they, they went even further and they tried to select a subspace of galaxies that had very, very similar overall spectra without going to specific um, you know, pro galaxy properties. And I remember there they, they have a Hubble diagram that was maybe three times tighter or something like that. Really? Yeah, yeah. Three times. Have this, I think they call it identical, identical you know, clean galaxies. You know. well, it'd be worth doing it again because there are a lot more supernovae now. No question? No. Okay. And let's thank the speaker again. For how, for how long are you going to stay here? Like uh, Until mid-October. Okay. So, yeah. So, if you have any questions, then you have until mid-October to ask. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>